the wealthy world is aging fast. In 1950, around one in every 12 people in high-income countries was over 65. By 2050, it's expected to be more like one in four. And it's storing up a big problem. It is a feat that we can live longer and that we can enjoy being alive for longer, but it's expensive. When people retire, they start to cost society more money. And the costs will soon be unsustainable. What's becoming increasingly clear is that the three-stage model of life, where you educate, you work, you retire, is fundamentally broken. Current approaches to care for the elderly are a massive drain on society's resources. If you look at it from an economical perspective, we are spending too much money on doing the wrong things. And these mistakes cost more than just money. I don't feel that the older population are valued. I think we may be an inconvenience. So how can societies provide high quality but affordable care for their growing elderly populations, both today and into the future? Yamakita, Japan. News crews have been sent to cover the final graduation ceremony at Miho Elementary School. What makes this national news is that 12-year-old Raiki Kodama is the only pupil in his year group. The 146-year-old school will close after Raiki's graduation. The town's population has dropped by around 30% over the past three decades, and there simply aren't enough pupils to keep a school open. Japan is the oldest nation on Earth, with the highest proportion of elderly people in its population. The changing shape of societies in the developed world is clearly shown by UN population data. In 1950, there were more than double the number of people in their 20s compared with those in their 60s. But today, the number in their 60s has nearly tripled. The number of children and retirees relative to those of working age is known as the dependency ratio. When this changes, it can mean that there are fewer workers to support the elderly, which has serious economic consequences. An ageing population, of course, brings lots of uh, good and exciting things, but it's expensive. The cost of pensions, the cost of healthcare, which is largely spent on people in their last years of life, it's very costly. When people retire in their 60s, they tend to spend less, pay less in taxes, and cost society more. A shrinking workforce can also cause GDP growth and investment to slow, which threatens economic stagnation. Some countries, such as France, have made repeated attempts to shake up their pension systems, including by raising the retirement age. But this has led to fierce protests. There are other ways to reduce the dependency ratio, such as encouraging immigration of skilled workers and improving childcare provision to encourage more women to work. But these aren't enough. A lot of this is about tweaking around the edges. And if you really think of the magnitude of the challenge here, the more fruitful thinking lies in a really quite a fundamental shift in how we think about different life stages. Many people are already challenging these traditional attitudes to ageing. At an age when most would be thinking about retiring, 68-year-old Julie Ford has reinvented herself as an entrepreneur. Hi Bridge, hi Nicola, how are you doing? I've been involved in health and fitness and I'm a PE teacher of 45 years. Yes, let's get out in that fresh air. And then I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I was physically still fit very important thing, smiling and breathing. If you can only do one at a time, can you just please breathe? <laughs> Julie designed and built a training aid called InStep and runs workout classes using it. Resistance training is the best for strength. Scientifically proven that moving with resistance is the golden ticket of exercise. Julie is part of an online community called Rest Less, which helps retirees who want to keep working. It was set up by Stuart Lewis. 
Everything we do is tailored to this demographic of people in their 50s, 60s and beyond. There's a wide range of life needs that people have and we're trying to meet them across health, community and social networking. Offering advice on jobs, pensions, further education and even dating, Restless helps people navigate one of the biggest transitions they will face in their lifetimes. You've worked 45 years, 50 years of your life and suddenly you stop. Well, what do you do? It is very difficult. You need, just need to look at the impact of someone who's been out of work for two years to see the impact on their physical health but also their mental health. It's the same when you enter retirement. For some people it can be quite a lonely and desolate time. But extending their working life might not be practical for everyone. People don't all experience ageing in the same way and that's a really important thing to, to keep in mind. I mean, a starting point is of course what kind of job you did all your life. Well, not everyone can work until they're 90. That still doesn't take away the fact that in the rich world, 90% of people will now reach their 65th birthday and most of them will still have plenty of healthy years ahead of them. Encouraging people to make use of these healthy years could unlock economic potential that's being lost in retirement. To make the most of this increasing life expectancy, to reap a so-called longevity dividend, you do need to make sure that you set the infrastructure up to make that possible. More flexible ways of tapping into, say, your pension savings, to employers taking a more open-minded approach. So we're invaluable in society, and I think we should be used or made use of. More flexible attitudes to retirement could help reduce the economic burden of increasing the elderly populations. But eventually, most people will need some form of medical or social care, and that is expensive. A lot of countries just haven't really grappled with the need to set up a decent social care system. Social care used to happen a lot in the family, sort of it used to be informally covered, as we would call it. There were always carers, but they were just unpaid carers. It's daunting because there are an awful lot of people that will need it, and it's a labour-intensive thing to do. In many developed countries, when people can no longer care for themselves, a typical answer is to move them out of their homes and communities into residential care. But as well as being increasingly unaffordable, this model of care can fail to address the emotional needs of elderly people. The rich world have taken a fairly reactive approach to, to care for the elderly. The traditional approach has been essentially warehousing people in nursing homes. The metrics of success have often been things like, has a person had any falls, have they lost any weight or do they have any bed sores? And because they became the important metrics, the institution started operating around those things. I think what's got lost in social care is a more community-focused approach. In the Netherlands, an organisation called Bertzorg is re-establishing this community approach to care. Ramona van den Arendt is a Bertzorg nurse working in Ada. Today, she has three male patients to visit, all with complex needs. Central to Burtzog's method is using local nursing teams who know the community and who are given real autonomy in managing their workload. You work together as a group, as a team. And together you um, discuss what kind of tasks everybody takes in the team. One of her patients today is 82-year-old Mr. Vandermeent, who suffers pain from cancer in his ear. Managing her own timetable means Ramona can give him the special care he needs to stay living safely in his own home. In healthcare, it's always changing how many clients you have, what is needed, how much time we need to spend at the clients. So it's necessary that we can take decisions ourselves. Bertzorg was set up by Joste Bluck who had himself been a community nurse for nearly a decade. So my idea was we just start from scratch and we just ask nurses to do uh, what they think they should do. Not on protocols, not on products. Look at the problem and try to solve the problem in the most effective way. The other key part of Bert Talk's philosophy is setting aside time to talk to the patient 
and build a deeper understanding of their needs and aspirations. I think the most important thing that when you come at the client's house, uh, it's important to listen, that you take the time to uh, hear somebody's story. It might seem inevitable that spending extra time with patients would drive up costs, but in Bert Talk's case, the opposite is true. If we trust people and we ask them to do what they think is needed, then we use the capacity more effectively than we're doing now. Separate studies by Ernst & Young and KPMG found that Bert Zorg delivered over 30% cost and 50% time savings compared with existing Dutch care systems. In a sector known for high staff turnover, it now employs over 10,000 nurses in the Netherlands and is operating in 30 countries. As well as being efficient, giving nurses independence also protects the independence of those in their care. Aging populations threaten societies with shrinking workforces, economic stagnation, and crippling costs for pensions and care. Simply throwing more money at the issue is not going to be enough. From a societal perspective, I think we're missing the huge opportunity we have to help people age better, to live better lives. Dealing with ageing is an opportunity, but also a problem that keeps getting kicked down the road. We can't just keep postponing actually dealing with it or wishfully thinking that tweaking around the edges around the retirement age will fix it. It needs a much, much bigger, more fundamental rethink. I'm Tom Standage, Deputy Editor of The Economist and Editor of The World Ahead. To read more of our future gazing coverage, click on the link. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.